I'm going to start with our distinguished uh, uh, co-chair from the commission, uh, Bob Hale. Bob Hale uh, has had a long uh, career at defense budgeting. He started off at CBO. He was Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for financial management and then wound up as the comptroller of the Department of Defense. He was co-chair of the commission. We also have Laura Sayer from the commission. She was the chief of staff. She came to the commission after holding several senior financial management positions, the last one being the comptroller for uh, Navy installations. And then we have two officers who dealt with the other side of PBBS, that is from the service and agency perspective. We have retired Lieutenant General Tom Spohr. General Spohr, in addition to a distinguished military career in uh, combat service, he held several senior positions on the Army staff and has written extensively on national security issues. And finally, but not least, we have John Ferrari, who also held uh, operational positions in the Army, but he also, in addition, uh, was head of the Army Analysis Group and worked uh, PPS, PBBS for uh, many years. He's now a non-resident uh, uh, scholar at uh, AEI and writes extensively about defense budgeting. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Bob and Laura to talk about the commission and its findings. Well, let me just start briefly by saying thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate the chance to speak with you about our final report. Lara and I are going to uh, share a short briefing with you to kind of talk about the wave tops of that report. And I'm going to ask Lara if she would start off. Oh, absolutely. Good morning, and thank you so much for having us here today. Um, so just to level set, uh, the commission was established by the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 22. Um, we were given a really broad tasking, but I will just focus on they tasked the commission to look at all four phases, all aspects of the PPBE process, especially regarding defense modernization. There's grave concerns about strategic threats, evolving technology, and so concerns about whether or not the current process can meet those needs anymore. We did conduct extensive research, and we had over 400 engagements with over 1,100 individuals across the entire ecosystem of PBBE, so Congress, DOD, industry, um, academia, and many others. Um, for those of you uh, who've worked in PPBE, you rec you'll recognize the four phases laid out here. I just want to highlight that you know, there have not been a lot of changes in the last 60 years since uh, McNamara established PPBS at the time. Um, these, a lot of these phases, while they work in parallel, um, they don't always work in a collaborative fashion. And so the programmers don't often have access to the same data or documents that the budgeteers have and vice versa. And so there's a lot of inefficiency in these very lengthy processes. And so if you're trying to get something into the budget, it's often you need to work two to three years in advance before Congress may appropriate the funds for it. So as we were looking at PPBE and um, the need for reform, we wanted to look at the current strengths and weaknesses of the system to make sure that any changes we would suggest would still preserve um, the goodness in the system. And just wanted to just to cover some of those strengths that PPBE does have a structured, repeatable process, brings relevant voices into the discussion, they are heard, um, cost estimates are brought in, various alternatives are considered. And so, you know, we do end up with a, a, with a strong budget. However, we heard over and over again the lack of speed, the lack of agility, especially the way technology is evolving today, that PPBE just does not meet that need. And with the way the budgets are late and the limited uh, appropriation timelines, especially for our operational accounts, that it's our execution of those funding and delivering a capability to the warfighter is sometimes less than optimal. So, um, so what we kept that in mind as we were suggesting reforms. And as we debated and discussed and met with the entire ecosystem, um, we determined from those conversations and our discussions as a commission, there were five critical areas for reform that we wanted to focus on and where we organized our research and our recommendations. And you'll see these five 
Um, and we'll, st we'll talk about each of the recommendations in some, some amount of detail um, within these five goals. So improving the alignment of budgets to strategy, um, fostering innovation and adaptability, especially in the year of execution, strengthening the relationship between DOD and Congress. And this is key if we're ever going to move at the speed of relevance. That relationship has to be stronger. Congress needs to be a strong partner with DOD here. But two key enablers as well that we, we are focused strongly on is uh, modernizing our business systems and data analytics, trying to bring the DOD into the modern era of how private sector operates, as well as strengthening the capacity and the capability of the resource, resourcing workforce. And people turn the crank, we know that the workforce is a key part of any reform as well as delivering these capabilities. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to Bob who will go into some more details. Well, Laura, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of the goals rather quickly. We made 28 recommendations in this final report. I'll give you just a few examples to give you a flavor of where we're headed. First goal is to better align budgets to strategy. That might sound kind of academic, but it's not. I mean, if you're, especially when the threats are changing rapidly, you need a budget aligned to strategy to be sure everybody's going in the same direction. Uh, we made a number of recommendations. I'll talk about two, the most fundamental of which uh, was to replace the current PBB process with a new process that we propose be called the Defense Resourcing System. <clears throat> it contains uh, three... Uh, uh, sub-processes, if you will, a strategy process, uh, a resource allocation process when you're actually building the budget you'll eventually submit to Congress, and then finally when Congress acts uh, execution uh, to spend the money to meet national security needs. Main thing we did is some streamlining, for example, combining the programming and budgeting uh, phases of the current PPPE because there's a lot of duplication. Also strengthening the guidance the services get uh, from, uh, from, the Office of Secretary, from the Secretary of Defense in order to build budgets that are aligned to strategy. And there we propose more analysis and more use of senior uh, decision-making uh, meetings in order to get more definitive guidance. The other one uh, recommendation I'll talk about is to transform the budget structure. Uh, we uh, recommend uh, that that budget structure uh, start with services and component <clears throat> but then be presented uh, to Congress in the, uh, using a major, what we call major capability or activity areas. DOD will have to choose these, but they could be things like tactical aviation, ground maneuver units, um, mobility aircraft. Um, and that's in comparison to today when we really use appropriation titles, procurement, rdt and &E, for example, uh, to, uh, to present the budget. Um, I think this will make some significant improvements, uh, mainly that we will present the budget in the way people talk about budgets. You know, when, they, when somebody asks you what's in the defense budget, you probably don't immediately say there's $175 billion of rdt and &E. You talk about what's going to be bought uh, and why it's being bought. And, and so we would present the budget in that structure to Congress and ask Congress to authorize and appropriate, uh, appropriate in, in that structure. We turn to our second goal, and that is to change processes in ways that foster innovation uh, and increase adaptability uh, to uh, meet change threats and change requirements. And <clears throat> here there are 11 recommendations. I'm going to pick just a couple to give you a flavor. One of the things we recommend is to increase the availability of operating funds. As many of you know, the operating budgets in, in DOD, the O&M and MILPERS budgets, and must all be obligated in the year in which they are appropriated. That leads to the infamous year-end spending uh, spree, as some call it, uh, when sometimes we obligate funds on lower priority projects just to avoid losing the money. We would uh, recommend DOD be allowed uh, to obligate a small portion of its operating dollars, 5%, or up to 5%, <clears throat> in the second year to mitigate the adverse effects uh, of this uh, of this year-end spending. We also recommend updating thresholds for the smaller reprogrammings uh, known as below threshold reprogrammings. Why is this important? Well, it's important because they're faster uh, than other reprogramming actions. They get out of the building quicker and they don't require advance uh, uh, approval by the Congress. 
And that's important if you're trying to foster innovation uh, when technology is changing rapidly. We wouldn't ask the DOD to be given any more flexibility here, simply to update the flexibility to reflect increases, uh, historical budget increases. So we went back two decades, uh, looked at the thresholds then, and if, for example, RDTNE as a whole had doubled in that period, we recommended doubling the threshold. And uh, you can see uh, on the slides uh, the numbers that came up, uh, which we hope will foster innovation, we think will. And finally, another example is to take steps to mitigate problems caused by continuing resolutions, which have unfortunately become a way of life. Um, we would, uh, we can't mitigate all the adverse effects, but uh, one of the problems with them is you're not allowed, uh, DOD is not allowed to put new starts into place um, uh, under a continuing resolution. We would propose the department be allowed to do that but to maintain congressional oversight, they could do it only uh, if all four uh, committees and, and subcommittees had passed the defense budget and none of them had restricted that new start. And we'd make analogous uh, suggestions for uh, uh, by sizes uh, of uh, weapon systems. Let me go on to our last three goals and I'll treat them in the interest of time together. I call them kind of business process goals. So I'll outline what they were. I'll give you a few examples of our recommendations there. We would encourage improved in-person communication between DOD and Congress. There's a lot of communication now as the budget uh, proposal is rolled out. But after that, it is more episodic, uh, and, and, and I think it generally at more junior levels. We would recommend some further senior engagement as Congress is debating the budget, both uh, to get uh, them to deal with executioner issues um, but, but also uh, to take into account changes in, in programs uh, that they may want to consider in their markups. It's been two years sometimes before these programs were put together for submission to Congress. Uh, if they had a chance uh, to make fixes that the department recommended, uh, it would help in execution. We recommend better communications of data between DOD and Congress and Congress back to DOD by establishing classified and unclassified communication enclaves or platforms uh, that, so that this data is more uh, searchable, it's more sortable, uh, and it's more easily extracted uh, for, for analysis. And we think uh, these, uh, these two proposals could help strengthen some of the relationships between DOD and Congress. And finally, just uh, one of our proposals on uh, uh, the uh, uh, recruiting, uh, the uh, DOD resourcing uh, workforce the commission is concerned that this workforce is under stress, uh, and in many cases they have a fair number of open uh, billets. We would urge them to continue what they're already doing on recruiting and retention, but perhaps go further and some uh, broader issues like maybe uh, requesting uh, recruiting and retention bonuses or uh, more use of contractor personnel uh, where that doesn't impinge on inherent governmental work. So let me sum up briefly uh, the advantages of this new system we're proposing. And the main one uh, is that it, we think it will help DOD react uh, to rapidly changing threats in technology and so help us uh, stay ahead of strategic competitors uh, like China. Uh, and this slide uh, lists some of the other uh, areas that I've talked about and how this DRS would accomplish that overall uh, goal. And finally, I'll talk about implementation. We made 28, we think, actionable recommendations. If we just toss those in the laps of a workforce in DOD and Congress that is very stressed handling day-to-day -day issues, the Commission is concerned uh, that we may not see many of these implemented. We would recommend the department put together an implementation team, take them out of the day-to-day -day activities, and let them oversee implementation of of, of those rec of our recommendations that DOD and Congress agree ought to be put in place. It should be cross-functional, we think it should report to the Deputy Secretary, and it should be temporary, but by that we mean probably at least three years, because it will take a while uh, to put in place some of these. And finally, Congress must be involved in the implementation efforts. Uh, uh, collaboration here is critical uh, if we are going to uh, actually see some of these important changes uh, put in place. So with that, I'll stop um, and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much.
Uh, let me make two points before we uh, turn to our other panelists. First, the commission published its report two days ago. Uh, that report is online. I recommend everyone to take a quick look at it. Uh, the report itself is quite thick. It has a lot of background material, but there is a, uh, uh, an executive summary and some slides uh, that give the uh, top end view. Uh, I'd also point out on our commission here that uh, we have two Army officers uh, here, but we uh, also have some service balance. Bob's military service was in the Navy. Mine was in the Marine Corps. Laura spent a lot of time with uh, Navy organizations, but was also uh, controller for the Air Force. So we do have service balance uh, in our panel. And with that note, I will turn the floor over to uh, Tom Spore. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And I'm you know, delighted to be part of this panel discussion this morning. I will start off by saying I am uh, surprised myself that I agree with every one of the commission's 28 recommendations. Mm -hmm. That is extraordinarily rare for me and, and, and for any kind of commission report. Uh, there's a couple that really appeal to me. One of them is the compression or molding, if you will, of the programming and the budget phases within the Pentagon. And I don't know to what degree that change will actually change organizations in the Pentagon as it stands right now. Comptroller shops and programmer shops are distinctly different. In many cases, don't even like each other. And so to the degree that this recommendation actually merges and molds those organizations really is an open question in my mind. But to the degree it can is so useful. In the Army, which John Ferrari and I came from, we programmers had to prepare the program. And then this was six weeks before OSD wanted it so to give it to the budget people so they could convert it into their own language and cross-check our work, which contributed to a lot of delays. And if we didn't have to do that, it would have freed up more time for us to do our decision-making process. And so, and that occurs also at the OSD level, where we would submit our program or, and budget to OSD, and both CAPE and the comptroller there would simultaneously look at it, analyze it, and in some cases issue decisions affecting the same program in the same year, which was always a puzzlement to us. So that, that makes perfect sense to me. Similarly, the idea to carry over operating funds to the next year will be, would be so useful. Uh, in the Army, at least, and I know the other services, we spend an extraordinary amount of effort trying to get to 99.999% of operating funds spent. And that perpetuates itself down to the lower levels, too, down to battalions, where they're trying to do the same thing. If we could ease that uh, ridiculous state of affairs, I think that'd be uh, terribly useful. But again, I'm in agreement with all uh, 28 of the Commission's findings. I would like to just kind of focus on a couple thoughts I have on the implementation and, and end with a caution. I, I do think it's important, though, to, to note, this is kind of the Sherlock Holmes, uh, the dog that didn't bark. What isn't in the Commission's report? And that is things which are so pie in the sky that they will never happen. So there, there's nothing in there that says Congress should stop doing continuing resolutions. Because that's like saying uh, cats and dogs should not fight. It's just not going to happen. And so it's a very kind of realistic, I think, commission report. And so instead of saying no more continuing resolutions, the commission proposes how to mitigate the impact of continuing resolutions on the Department of Defense, which I think is a really uh, wise uh, way to go. I'll also note another thing, and I'm not the first to say this, is that the current system can work fast, it can work efficiently, but rarely does. And so I go back to the examples of the, the MRAP program or the funding that was pri provided to uh, JAIDO, the counter IAD task force. Both of those were fast, rapid response kinds of things. The dilemma was it took the, uh, either the Secretary of the Defense or the Deputy Secretary to become involved. And that can't be the normal state of affairs in the Pentagon. The, the, the system must move quickly, not by exception, but by routine. And so. For that matter, I think these, um, these recommendations are useful to, to do that. Um, in terms of implementation, some of these are easy and should not meet with much resistance, like bringing in new IT systems and, and classified and unclassified enclaves. That should be fairly straightforward and easy. The more harder will be this changing of the fundamental budget structure uh, for the Pentagon to put capabilities in front of appropriations. And there are people as your audience knows, that have organized their lives around being an appropriator by appropriation. So they, they define themselves as a, I'm an R&D analyst, or I'm an O&M analyst. Does that change or not? 
I think in order for the commission's recommendations to really kind of come to full fruition, they has to change. You can't have a person that organizes their life looking at things by appropriation. They have to look at them by capability area and appropriation later. So I'd, I'd be interested to see how much uh, that take hold that takes hold. Uh, uh, Secretary Hill kind of mentioned this, but this is going to require the explicit, not just the tacit approval of the defense uh, subcommittees for appropriations in both the House and the Senate. They, it's just not something that DOD can do on their own. And uh, I was pleased to see that a couple of the commission member, commissioners came from that world, from the appropriators world. But nevertheless, uh, that resistance can be fairly significant. And without it, a lot of these recommendations will not come to pass, I think. I, you know, John and I have this experience when, you know, in the Army, at least, I'm sure it's the other services, each service has their own liaison staff for both the authorizers and the appropriators. And when, if you ask why is it that way, it's because the appropriators want it and don't bother trying to change it. And so that's the same kind of way it is about other aspects of this. It's going to take the appropriators to kind of play and work with DOD to make these things happen. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to happen, and I, that would be a tragic um, thing. I would have liked to have seen, and I'm sure the members here can tell us, I would have liked to have seen legislative language that actually implemented some of these things. Like, okay, here is the, here is the bill, the amendment, if you will, that actually tells DOD you can, you can carry over 5% of your operating accounts. And uh, they could have run out of time. I'm sure they'll be able to say why that didn't happen. Uh, I will also mention, and this is kind of a throwaway, is that to implement this fully will require a truly functioning and operating Congress, which we really don't have today. We define success in Congress as the ability to preclude a government shutdown. And so we're going to have to get back to business as usual uh, for this report to be fully implemented. My final thing is a caution. The uh, Secretary Hale mentioned this too, that the commission recommends strong, stronger guidance, if you will, from OSD in terms of the strategy to which the services can build their programs. And I think that's useful. We should be cautious, though, that some, some not all good ideas begin at the service level. There are some, you know, think organically grown ideas that occur at the service level. And what comes to mind for me is General Berger's uh, Force Design 2030, which could not probably have been conceived at the OSD level. And so this strategic guidance that will ensue if that recommendation is followed needs to be flexible enough to allow the services uh, to come up with good ideas and for them not to be squashed in the resourcing uh, process. So I'll, I'll end there and turn this over, I guess, to John. John. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things. I'm going to focus uh, more on implementation. But first, uh, I want to echo uh, what Tom said and what others said, uh, that the, the commission did great work, right? And so this isn't about kind of nitpicking anything in there because I think they've hit the target uh, very well. And, and what I want to do is not necessarily thank the commissioners, right? Everybody will do that. I want to thank the staff that worked on it because uh, actually having gone through that report and read it, uh, you can read it, it's understandable, uh, and having been, you know, a staffer myself, right, the amount of work and the time that the staff puts in to put these together uh, often goes unrecognized. So, so a shout out to, to the real people who did all of the work to provide the commissioners with all the ana analysis so that they can make their, their recommendations. Uh, I think, though, as hard as it has been to put up with that report, right, uh, we can't undersell the difficulty it's going to be to implement the change. And, and, and one can say, like, the easy work has actually been done, uh, no matter how hard it was, and, and the hard work really has started. Uh, and there, there are a couple of things uh, just from having operated inside the system. Uh, and one thing that can't be underestimated is the need for everybody involved to rebuild trust. So the, the current system operates in a low trust environment. And so that's why all of these processes and systems and controls and all of it is in there. Uh, some of it's separation of powers, uh, but a lot of it is just a stacking of decades of perceived problems where more controls were put in place. So in order to loosen the controls, uh, there's going to have to be a resetting of trust. And, and I think the commission hit right on the 
hit the nail on the head with much more in-person uh, contact because trust is not earned by sending reports back and forth or, or through phone calls or Zoom, right? It's that human dimension of the process that, that, that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the second is stability, right? So, so the process is just that, it's a, it's a process. Uh, but if you look at the defense funding, the resources of the defense resource system, uh, oftentimes it's planned to be a, right, it's a flat line, whatever we have. But when you actually look at the funding over decades, it's actually a sine wave, right? The funding is constantly changing. It's going up and down. And so that leads to then bad decisions and what looks like uh, a breakdown in the process of programs and weapon systems that are started, units that are inactivated, ships that aren't built. Uh, and a lot of that is driven by funding. And if you go back to sequestration, you can look at the Fiscal Responsibility Act where the department is now going through and changing things. And so I think we have to be careful to think that the process changes all of a sudden are going to lead to a better military if we don't look at some of those other issues such as funding stability. Uh, I think we underestimate the, uh, I, the antiquated IT systems within DOD that are going to need to be updated to, to do this. Uh, one can imagine that uh, many of them are now were built hard-coded in with these appropriations and numbers and digits uh, in, 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 in antiquated languages. So when we say, well, just change the appropriation label to this and do that, uh, and, and as we can see with, it, with lots of IT system reforms done in the government, that is not a strong uh, area where the government is, is, is good at and the military isn't. And so I think on the implementation team, they've got it like that's got to be one of the first things they go after because if you try to change everything and the IT system uh, can't handle it, uh, we could be sitting here 10 years from now, uh, you know, talking about why it, why it hasn't done. And right, anyone who has children in college today and is awaiting financial aid, right, a simplification of a financial aid form is right, isn't happening, and it, it's, right, so, so even something as simple as that, right, this is 10x, 100x more complicated, so they need to really bring in some smart people who, who, can, who can do this. Uh, and then the last thing, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, is uh, I think we underestimate the implementation task ahead for the appropriators, uh, who, who in essence, the, the, the entire PPBE system is actually set up to serve the appropriators, because in the end, that's where the money is appropriated. Uh, and so yeah, I think we have to, the implementation team is gonna have to work through, well, what if the appropriators don't change? What parts of these, if you implement it, but don't implement the other part, right, might have a secondary effect or not? Uh, and so, so I think, right, the appropriators have to be in this early. Uh, and I'd recommend them all getting copies of the report and, and becoming cheerleaders for it, right? And if the appropriators will know this thing will work when the appropriators hold it up and say, we're gonna do this, uh, DOD is moving too slow. Uh, and so that's the scenario I'm hoping for. Uh, I'm not sure how much money I would put on it, but, but if we could, that, that right for all the appropriators out there listening in, right, become the cheerleaders for this and, and this can be implemented. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me say first before I uh, ask some additional questions to note that there's a mechanism for our online audience to uh, send questions in also. Uh, I think the first thing I'm gonna ask about is this question that came up from both John and Tom about implementation. Uh, I know you've had many interactions with Congress and DOD has just come out with a memo uh, proposing to implement some of the ideas that came out in your interim report. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of those challenges and how you see that playing out. Well, first off, uh, I mean, the commission viewed these, uh, views, uh, these recommendations as urgent. Uh, if we were going to stay ahead of near-peer competitors, we need more flexibility. Partly for that reason, we spent a lot of time uh, with uh, DOD, but also a lot of time with Congress, including the appropriators, but the authorizers too, because they will uh, play a role. Um, and, you know, I look, look back, some people say, well, gee, how could Congress make any changes in process when there are so many substantive issues that are 
in flux, and yet, uh, you know, they were in flux a couple of years ago, and we made major changes in the acquisition uh, offices in, in DOD, uh, getting rid of the acquisition technology and logistics, going to two undersecretaries. Five years ago, we made major changes in the military retirement system. So I think there's precedent here, and so I'm hopeful uh, that many of these uh, will get acted on. The implementation will certainly fall to DOD and Congress primarily. We are not tasked in the law with doing implementation. However, the law does allow the commission to remain in place for six months uh, and spend money during that period. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to see some drawdown in our staff, uh, and you're right about their importance. Uh, they were critical to this. Uh, but uh, if DOD wants help or Congress uh, help on implementation, and if we commission has the ability to provide it, we'll certainly do it. So, um, you know, I know there's a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, I'm, uh, man, I I'm hopeful uh, that we're going to see uh, many or most of these uh, recommendations put in place. Larry, you want to add to that? Well, I would add, you know, the congressional staff on both sides, the authorizers and the appropriators, were really generous with their time um, and very open with their feedback, what they liked or didn't like, uh, leading up to the interim report and after that. Um, in general, we really want to make their job easier. That's why we're talking about the, the way we structure the budget, the justification books, if you've ever had the misfortune of trying to read an RDOC or a PDOC or o, an O&MJ book is even worse, trying to make their job easier to understand what DOD is asking for. The communication enclaves are key. The, the IT systems, you're, I absolutely agree. That's I've operated in them. I started off as a GS7, having to load funding in the accounting system and then cutting PRs, purchase requests, um, and they are just unforgiving systems. And so making people executing at the ground level all the way up to the appropriators and authorizers so that they can understand what we're asking for from a department perspective and want to give that budget. Um, there, you know, if, we, if we're going to restructure the budget, I think we have examples within the department where it's been pockets of excellence. So I spent some time at Special Operations Command as the Deputy Comptroller. We worked closely with all four congressional uh, defense committees to do some restructuring of the investment accounts and the O&M accounts. And they were, we worked side by side to, do, to come up with something that was good for the command and good for uh, Congress. And Army has done that, restructuring some of their RDT and E lines. And so, even in fact, in the recent, I think, 2024 um, appropriations, the SACD came out with language applauding that, the reduction, I think, of 93 program elements on the R&D side of the Army, and then suggesting they take that step also for the procurement. So I think there's willingness if we work on that relationship and we work collaboratively in an open fashion, not just throwing it over in a J book. Let me ask about two things that you did not recommend, and you do talk about them in the report. One of them is uh, multi-year budgets, uh, and the other one is um, changing the fiscal year, which goes a little beyond DOD, of course, but uh, we've done that before, and there have been proposals out there that you know, maybe it's time to do that again. Uh, talk us a little about you know, why you didn't go uh, in those directions. Well, we talked about both of them uh, in, in the commission. On biennial budgeting, I, I, I think the decision was it didn't work in the 1980s, and I think the fundamental reason it failed is that the appropriators were never willing to provide a two-year appropriation, and so DOD was really dealing with a one-year budget. They got some authorization. Even there, they didn't get full authorizations. Uh, so we didn't see any reason why those problems wouldn't repeat, and so decided not to recommend uh, biennial budgeting. Uh, no, we should have... Moving the fiscal year. Uh, the fiscal year. We also <laughs> talked about that. I actually went into this commission thinking we should do that. It creates enormous problems uh, for, for the department and staff because you'd be moving the fiscal year potentially to December 31st, which would be a disaster. Um, and we could never figure out a practical way to do that, I guess is a fair statement. And so finally, uh, look for ways to mitigate adverse effects. Also, it's not obvious that it, it, it wouldn't just delay everything three months, as happened back in 1976 when we moved the 
uh, from June 30th uh, to September 30th. So you want to add to that? Well, when it was brought up in the commission, I said, do you hate the November and December holidays? <laughs> because <laughs> I've worked close out all, <laughs> and some other words with it. Uh, uh, I've worked close out almost 26 years, and it's the last two or three months of the fiscal year where you're trying to get money executed, and it's not just a few bean counters, it's the contracting officers, the program managers. I've done it from a program office all the way to command level. And so it's just, it's impossible whenever it is, but then you're gonna put it over the holidays. Um, and we just didn't think it would really, it would really improve anything. We would just kick the can, so, yeah. yeah. John, Tom, I don't know if you wanna add anything. I know you have some of the scars yeah. from that multi-year, you know, well, this, budget. This idea of a biannual budget or program has been tried, as the Secretary mentioned, it didn't work. And if you're trying to build a resource allocation system is more responsive. Stretching out the timelines is not the solution to that. And every time the Pentagon tried it, they would say, we're going to just do a mini POM in the off year, and the mini POM blew up to be the regular POM. And so it's been tried. This is an idea I think that we should just put to bed. Yeah, I think maybe the answer is we need much easier use of multi-year authorities for procurement programs, right? And that's where I think the industrial base uh, really can benefit from the stability. And, and I think the current rules around multi-year procurement are onerous uh, and, and don't take into account that, you know, they, they look at the funding levels in the near term, but they don't take into account the, the surge risk in the, in the industrial base and, 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 and the long-term costs of not doing that. So, so I'd like to see uh, more liberal use of and delegation to the services for multi-year procurement uh, because it literally is a, an act of Congress uh, to, to, to get that done. Let me ask a couple of other questions that came up in the report uh, we haven't talked too much about. One of them is metrics, and you know, metrics are you know, the holy grail of management theory. Um, what kind of metrics do you think that uh, senior leadership at DOD ought to be tracking? You know, people talk about a dashboard. Um, give us some sense about what those would look like. Well, first, DOD has thousands of metrics uh, that they use, to, uh, especially in the agencies that are providing support activities, but, but even throughout the department. I think the problem is is more how they're used uh, and they don't, there's not an easy feedback loop or a loop that, that ties those metrics back to budget formulation, partly because the timing is off. I mean, you're executing a budget that you would like to have influence the future budget, but you're still in the middle of execution. Uh, so you have to go back to the year before to get, to get metrics. Um, and the, the other thing is we, we rarely, step back and ask, did we get our money's worth uh, for this program? I mean, uh, not just did it come in on time and on budget, but did it actually do what we needed done and what we expected to have done? So I'd, I'd focus more, and I, and I think we mentioned these points in our report, on how metrics are used rather than establishing new ones. But Lara did a lot of this work, so I will uh, uh, ask her to Sure. Well, one of the key parts of the new defense resourcing system is continuous analysis and evaluation. And so that process would kick off in the October, November timeframe with your senior leader council with threat-based briefings, war gaming analysis, and then looking at performance measures using AI to look at different scenarios. And that would feed through the rest of the process so that when you got guidance, it was informed by evaluating results of previous budgets, current budgets. Um, when we looked at performance measures, it's clear the department's using them, they're trying to use it in a more dashboard fashion with Advana and an application on it. Um, it's still in its nascent stages. So, I mean, it's encouraging the department's working towards that. Um, we had concerns about, um, you know, readiness metrics are great. When I was at Navy Installations Command, we looked at, you know, base incursions, different things related to that. But when we looked at from a financial execution standpoint, the obligation and expenditure benchmarks that have been used for decades and haven't been revised, it's pretty clear in many cases that we're measuring, we have the wrong metric. And so when your metric is wrong, you're wasting a lot of time. Um, 
measuring something inappropriately. So for our example, the rdt and &E appropriation, we say it's supposed to have be 90% obligated and 55% expended by 30 September. Well, that's great if you're a major space system that spends billions of dollars. But if you're a small s and program or project, you're not gonna execute on that timeline, and yet we measure them as though they should execute the same way. And so we're asking the department to look at at the line item level, where does that execution actually happen instead of the total appropriation? So, um, yeah, we have concerns that the right metric should be used, but again, that feedback loop should be happening as we go through the resourcing process. Okay, Tom, anything you want to add? Uh, other than we don't have, we have not just bad metrics now, we have metrics that drive us to do bad things, and that is this obligation rate and expenditure rate of appropriations. It's just drives all kinds of bad behaviors, and it is the overwhelming focus of both the Pentagon at every level and Congress when they start demanding the execution rates and why haven't you executed in the, under the fear that we're gonna take that money and, and place it somewhere else. And so to the degree we can reorient that towards delivering capability to the force, one of the metrics I use imperfectly is how long does it take to completely field a significant portion of the Army with a new capability, like the Joint Lightweight Tactical Vehicle or something like that. How many years is it going to take to bring that into the system versus what is the expenditure rate of the JLTV program? And that, that's my thought on that topic. So I, I think metrics uh, really aligns to strategy, which is really the, the front end, and, and you talk about that uh, a, a lot in the report. Uh, but, it, you know, it's the age-old question, right, to do what, right? If you ask 10 people what it is the Department of Defense is doing, you'll get 10 different answers. And if you build a force optimized for something and you're measuring that, as the former Secretary of Defense, uh, Gates said, right, we get that wrong all the time. So, so inherently, you're trying to build a, a you know, a, a Swiss Army knife that has all these different capabilities that then can be pieced together to do something you really didn't anticipate or even in many cases don't want to do. And I think just recently, right, uh, the past decade, the military and the, the strategy was we're getting out of the Middle East and yet there we are back. And so you made decisions that in hindsight you might not have made and, and there's no changes to the PPB system or the DRS Right, that if you get the strategy wrong, somehow this process is going to magically make the department come out with the outcomes you, you want. Right, it's an inherently messy world, uh, and the department's got to be prepared for a lot of things. So, so the notion that right, the Secretary of Defense can sit there with five or six dashboard metrics, I think, uh, right, just uh, is not feasible. I want to pick up on a, something that Lara said uh, that's in the report at some length, and that is about continuous analysis, and ask how, how does that work as opposed to what we're doing now, because there are analysis organizations at OSD, of course, CAPE, and then each of the services has analysis organizations, and each of the OSD agencies you know, have an analysis. So how would that be different from what they're doing today? Yeah, so, so it would start earlier in the process. The way it's today in PBBE, it's, it's sort of at the tail end with the spears they do in the summertime. And so instead of analysis deriving the defense planning guidance, it's sort of on the end. And you jam up the deputy secretary and the secretary of defense at the end of the Palman budget cycle. And they're trying to make decisions basically on the margin because of when that analysis actually comes to bear in the process. So we're talking about early and throughout. Um, the good news is the current Deputy Secretary reinvigorated analysis with the analysis working group, and so there's a lot of this, um, I guess, muscle memory coming back into the department. We're just trying to get them to start it earlier. Um, also, using the Senior Leadership Council and the DMAGs involves the joint force, all the services, where they would be bringing their own analysis and wargaming, and they'd be part of the conversation and debating these issues eventually an adult has to be in the room and make the decision what, what we will be doing as a department, but that all those voices will be heard earlier and throughout. Bob, you want to add? Oh, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Anything uh, from our analytic uh, organization? You know, most of this is done in a classified setting, so I don't have a good sense of the current state of the analysis of OSD, but I, I think it remains poor, is my sense in analysis, because you never hear a senior DOD leader 
when they testify to Congress or in any other forum, refer to any sort of analysis which concludes this capability would be useful in that scenario. And I would have to think if they had such analysis, they would use it to better justify their program. So that's my only conclusion on that topic. And John, you led the Army's analysis organization. Yeah, so what I would say is uh, if, if the analysis is going to be worthwhile and in the end, right, the, the, the customer of all of this stuff is the Congress to appropriate money based upon it, I think the department, again, in the in venue of trust is going to have to let Congress in early. Uh, a lot of time it'll do analysis and then uh, I think from the congressional point of view, Right, there may be a belief or a lack of trust that uh, that the department is bringing forward the analysis that, it, or is bringing forward the analysis that perhaps supports the position it wants to take, and that the Congress doesn't have full access to all of that. Uh, so it goes back to trust, right? If you're going to do it, uh, and and this is going to be a system of collaboration, then you're going to have to bring the appropriators and the authorizers also in on the front end because it's a journey of education and learning for capabilities. Uh, and I think oftentimes, right, the way the budget is set up today, right in February or in this case March, you, you show up and you yell surprise. Uh, but don't worry, it's backed by analysis. Uh, but it's classified so we can't show it to you. We can let you look at it. So, so I think uh, if the department opened that up made it less classified perhaps, uh, and, and I'm not saying unclassified, but less classified, uh, so that the average congressional staffer and bring them in early and make it more collaborative, that would go, go a long way. Let me reclaim yeah. a minute of my time to say, <laughs> you know, part of this continuous uh, proposal for continuous analysis isn't just the cost-benefit analysis during programming, which I think is kind of the focus uh, that, that's been discussed. It's, it's threat analysis, it's wargaming uh, that leads to, this, and other types of analyses that lead to uh, a, a strategy and, and meetings on the strategy that we hope <clears throat> will provide more definitive guidance. So, you know, we would, uh, we would view expanding uh, not only when it's done, but, but also the kinds of analyses that are provided. Let me channel my uh, analytic community here for a moment uh, and also express a continuing frustration of mine. Uh, some years ago there was an analytic agenda that sought to have a sort of a consolidated set of scenarios that the services would all uh, plan to and that they were able then to explain to the public you know, why it was that we had the force structure particularly that we did and why uh, did the Army have 56, you know, combat brigades, you know, why did the Navy have 300 ships, you know, why was 280 too few and 320 too many, um, and that disappeared, and ever since then, the fourth structure tables are published and say, and this is what we need. Uh, was there any thought about or discussion about the, you know, that the campaign analysis that seems to have gone away, or analytic agenda, or those kinds of uh, analytic efforts? Well, I think in general terms, yes, uh, in the specifics of exactly how you determine the force structure, uh, not so much. But um, in general terms, as, as I said, we would envision that kind of analysis hopefully going on th throughout the year and for all of the phases of the new defense resourcing system. Uh, but certainly, uh, the, the kinds of things you were discussing, force structure kinds of issues, would, would need to come up uh, as you move toward determining a strategy uh, uh, and, and providing guidance to the services to carry out that strategy. So in general terms, yes. I think we never got to the level of discussing, you know, how you determine the, the number of brigades the, the Army needs. But you want to add to this? Well, we did have concerns about the workforce regarding analysis and analytic capability. Um, the tools as well as the training that seems to lack, we'd be lacking. So when we look at a couple of our recommendations and we could talk about a common analytics platform, we're talking about a system of systems so that everyone has access to best of breed tools. Um, throughout the, the last two years of being on this commission, I looked at a lot of different IT systems 
I've seen different pockets of excellence within the Department of Defense, but what the Air Force is doing, which might be a great analytical tool for their wargaming and analysis, should the Navy be using it? But of course, we don't like to, the services that have their own cultures and bespoke systems, they don't like to share. So we're trying to encourage that open dialogue and use of common tools across the Department of Defense. But with that also is workforce training, and one of our recommendations is improved training. Data analytics is a key one, because a lot of us you know, have been around 20, 30 years, our skills are old, we need to know these common tools, we need to know the current tools, um, and certainly use what is used in the private sector. And so uh, that's gotta be a huge, a huge training point for the department to get everyone upskilled to be able to use these analytic platforms. John, Tom, anything you'd like to add? Well, part of the reason the analytic process broke down at the OSD level was extraordinary disagreement on the assumptions that should flow into these things. And I, I'll just use the Army as an example. You know, we were told, you know, the current defense strategy is we will fight and win in one theater and do something else in the other. What that other thing we would do in the other theater was always undefined, make a scary face or, or issue ultimatums or something like that. And so in the face of that, the Army was a perpetual loser because the main scenario OSD would plan against was a China scenario, and the Middle East and Europe was hold or, some, or deter or something like that. And so the scenarios never favored a, a ground force, at least recently. And so you have to get agreement on this assumptions that start the analytical process before you can agree with the end result of your analytics. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I'll echo the, the assumptions uh, matter to analytics. So if you assume one short war, uh, you then cannot be surprised that you actually can't produce enough artillery rounds. Yet uh, the leadership, after assuming that, stands up and goes, well, I can't believe we're running out of ammunition. And, right, it's a, it's a, it's a crisis. And, and then it leads to a cynicism with the public who says, you mean I spent $850 billion and I can't have enough artillery rounds to last, you know, uh, you know, more than more than a few months or a year. Uh, so, so I think the, the the thing with the analytic agenda is again it goes back to the strategy, right, and the assumptions that are based on it, and and that's often underlooked. And those are those are important decisions of state that have to be agreed to. Uh, and and I'd say in that in that respect, not the Congress and the administration many times are not aligned, and then that leads to a lot of the fights over resources, which then leads to the micromanagement of the resources, uh, and then the strictures, and more program elements and restrictions as they try to kind of use the appropriation process to kind of battle out the big ticket items uh, up top. So, so, uh, so I concur with the commission to, you know, we've got to do better in that area. Let me ask a what might be an inside baseball question, but is uh, important to the analytic and budgeting communities, which is the proposal to combine the programming process and the budgeting process. And uh, I feel the services pain for having to go through it twice uh, when the processes are separate. Of course, the, the concept was programming would take care of the sort of big decisions, budgeting would take care of pricing and executability, and they would complement each other, but of course, you know, the programming issues used to, used to bleed into the budget system, and then you would have you know, uh, competing uh, decision processes. The commission proposed combining those with one decision um, um, document and that would be signed by the comptroller. Uh, and I was wondering you know, about first combining these, these two different to the concepts, you know, the, the big programming, the pricing and executability, and the fact that in, in a sense now the programmers are going to be under the comptroller, relates it not organizationally, but the comptroller is going to have some you know, important influence by being the one who signs the document. Well, first, <clears throat> what, what we said in the report is that the comptroller uh, would be the office's primary responsibility for this combined, uh, we call it the decision step. Um, but, uh, and, and, and they would be focused on schedule because they've got to be sure the budget is done by whatever uh, timing is in place uh, that particular year, and also responsible for being sure a single system was used, which DOD has finally moved to, uh, to record the decisions uh, aiming for that one document. 
But we also said that we envision uh, that CAPE and Comptroller will play similar roles uh, as they do now in the separate uh, programming and budgeting phases, uh, with CAPE more oriented toward providing analysis of alternatives because that's their strength, um, and the Comptroller uh, more responsible, uh, responsible for um, documenting results for doing the pricing analysis, executability analysis, kinds of things they do now. So yes, Comptroller would be the main OPR for schedule, but we, uh, and we don't recommend combining CAPE and Comptroller, which would probably take a law at this point, and I don't think it's, that's worth the, the effort, uh, but, but rather let them do their separate uh, tasks uh, with, uh, with the Comptroller making sure the schedule works. I would just add, you know, there are pockets of excellence, again, where programming and budgeting is more collaborative in the department, um, where they are co-located, and they use the same database and have for decades. Uh, I spent the majority of my career was in system program offices working on space systems, and I got to build, do the cost estimate for the program office estimate, build the POM and the BES, and it never made any sense to me why I had to do a separate document for a POM and a BES. I talked to different people, and the end result was, often the same if I was lucky, although there were times where there were competing or conflicting guidance from the different sides, but it's certainly efficiency that the bulk of the folks that work in the resourcing process are not in the Pentagon. They're in the field trying to execute and deliver capability, and so we're gonna make their lives easier. So they're not gonna be focused on, again, just this churn of documents and paperwork. They're gonna actually get to execute and deliver capability. Anything, uh, John? Yeah, so I, I think you know the, the system that we have now with separate, because it, it, it's more than just a pro pom and a budget, right? The, the, there's the, at the service level, it starts at the field, and then the baton gets handed to the service, to the military department, to the services, then to the military. Right? It's this 1950 conveyor belt of yep. you know producing this document that then falls off the end, and then you're like go to the, go to go and start again, uh, and and I think that there should just be one IT system that whether you're a program office or a service or a secretariat or OSD or the Congress or OMB, one IT system that all that data resides in and it's a continuous action that at some point the, the comptroller who goes, dude, it's like December, like they just snap it and and then really that system should spit out most of the budget documents that are needed without much budget review because they're doing it. So, so I think, uh, right, that there should be no service program budget data systems, right? It should be one. And then, it, right, instead of passing PDFs over to the Congress, right, the Congress just opens up their portal and there it is and they, they appropriate it and it just comes back. And so, so I think... That's where I talk about the IT systems, right? Uh, if you don't fix that, you're gonna remain batching and queuing and passing digits that don't necessarily match. And Tom, anything you want well, to add? Other than if we do not change the way they're organized, at least at the service level, from, and maybe OSD as well, and break down these barriers between the programmers and the budget, this, that recommendation of the commissions will never be fully realized. You can open the door in our budget office in the Army, and you can see a sea of desks that belong to the O&M analysts, and then go to the next section over in the, in the wedge and get to the procurement analysts. And the, new, the system of putting capability area first and appropriation last won't work in that, unless you just put you know, a Band-Aid on something. Let, Let me ask you, say, oh, uh, go ahead. The DOD has put, or OSD, I should say, has put in place a single system, the Next Generation Resource Management System. Uh, and they are using it, uh, and, and I think it's doing well, uh, at least uh, from what we've heard. They've asked the services if they want to use it, and at least one service has expressed interest, at least that's what we were told. Um, and hopefully, maybe if it succeeds, the services will move in that direction, because I agree with you. It'd be great to have one system uh, so we weren't constantly having to send data between different systems. We have time for one more question, a lightning round here, so you know, keep your, your thoughts to one minute here, but it's the red meat question, which we were talking about earlier, which is auditing. And the commission had to um, 
provide some recommendations and some insight there, not a complete uh, review of auditing. And I know other people have some strong opinions about that. So why don't you just give us a quick view of you know, what you, the commission did, and then we'll ask for some opinions on the auditing. So the commission was directed to look at FM systems as they affect audit and internal controls. We were not tasked to look at the full audit. Uh, there's a lot more issues there, as, as this group knows. Uh, but we undertook our mission. We put together a Tiger team, uh, used our own staff. Uh, there's a report from that Tiger team published in the report. That's part of why it's so long. There's a lot of those kinds of reports. And then the commission made a few recommendations. I, I'll pick one, uh, and that is that we need a better governance process, probably for all business systems, uh, but especially uh, from our standpoint, for the ones that affect uh, resource management. We didn't tell the department how to do it. We did give them an example, and uh, the, the one uh, that I'll cite deals with the, what are called the feeder systems, They're the systems outside financial management that feed in from acquisition, personnel, logistics, feed into the, uh, the uh, the accounting systems. Um, those are run by uh, individuals outside of resource management and sometimes they don't want to particularly spend their money making changes on audit. And so the feeder systems have not come as far as the accounting uh, systems have. We recommended that the comptroller would be allowed to put together a report on what he or she believes are the most important changes needed in these feeder systems. Um, and, and then staff it to the other functional areas. And if there's disagreement, there'd be a DMAG at which the deputy could make decisions. The hope being we'll start getting more attention on these feeder systems because they're not getting fixed, or at least a number of them are not getting fixed. And there are a number of other recommendations, uh, but I'll stop there. You want to add to this? Um, I would just say that one of the things we recommended is that the DOD do a better job of prioritizing their activities towards audit. You can't boil the ocean and get there all in one year when you consider the vast number of systems and the amount of money and assets in the Department of Defense. So a Marine Corps is a great example of a prioritization of a small, a small grouping of the DOD, but also looking at things like asset valuation and what, what does bring value in the audit and what doesn't. So it's perhaps time for DOD to look at talking to FASAB and saying maybe we should treat assets in the manner of which DOD and Congress actually value them and not use, uh, we're not a publicly traded company, do we really need to do depreciation and track all that, um, the amount of work associated with it, is it adding value to military utility and to, to the taxpayer? Uh, Tom, you've got some opinions yeah, on this. I, I would. We, DOD spends roughly a billion dollars a year on audit, all, all in, and I think for that amount of money they're getting nowhere near the, the return on their investment. I think there are some elements of audit, and I'm not an auditor, but I think when I hear people, auditors talk about it, the areas where it has the most value are these transactions we do with Treasury, which don't connect with each other, I forget the exact name of that, where the audit has very little value in my view is existence, completeness, and valuation. Do they have the number of F-35s that they say they think they have? Do they have enough, the same number of uh, Humvees, that type of thing? There are other systems that exist in every service to monitor the presence of these things. Now, are there great examples where somebody says, look, we found a whole warehouse of spare parts in the audit that no one, the service didn't even know they had? Well, I guarantee you the service knew they had it. Maybe it wasn't accounted for correctly in their current system of record for accountability, but they knew they had it. And so I think, you know, we are, again, I, well respect to the auditors, we are enriching the big four audit companies with very little value uh, to the Department of Defense, and I see no end in sight. I know the Marine Corps uh, passed their audit this year. They passed it five years ago or seven years ago, but decided they hadn't passed it. I just don't see a, a value in this quest. John, anything? Uh, just I'll, I'll be quick and echo uh, what was said, which is I think it's time now that everybody's learned a lot about the audit, and I think that uh, there should be separate audit standards for DOD because it is so different than everything else. And so I think here's a case where the Congress, who wants the audit, should be working with DOD and then the, the auditing agencies and say, okay, what are the standards now that we've learned that, that we really want DOD to meet because they're not a publicly traded company. And so I think that would add value to the process and, and get the Congress 
the information and the oversight ability that they are looking for. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. We look forward to seeing what happens with all of the recommendations. Some of them clearly are going to be implemented quickly. Some of them, I think, will uh, engender a lot of discussion. Um, so we will uh, be watching this as uh, events unfold. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.